Would you pray with me? Spirit of God, your, uh, your scriptures can sometimes make us laugh. They challenge us. But they're a real account of the struggles of a people who are seeking to do your work. We seek to learn from them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. First text of Scripture comes from the beginning of Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words. The voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And from Acts 17, Paul is speaking to um, a skeptical audience. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we too are his offspring. The grass withers in the flower, fades, but the word of our God stands forever. 1967. 1967 was the last year that the Presbyterian Church had more members at the end of the year than it had the year before. 1967, it's all been downhill from there. It can get a little discouraging if you're a preacher. Trust me, I know. There are a lot of reasons for it. You know, there was the cultural upheaval of the 60s. That tended to turn things on their head. Kids did not particularly want to do what their parents were asking them to do, and that's mostly how people got to church anyway. And it was the time of the me generation. And you, if you're focused on me, well, God takes second place is, I guess, what happens. And then there was the problem that, you know, our parents kept sending us to school. You know, that, that's just, it doesn't work out because, you know, you go to school and you learn all this stuff about the way the universe works and it's in direct contradiction to that which you learn in church and the church never got around to telling you how to figure those two things out. In any case, the church then shrinks. It's inexorable. You know, for a while I tried to fight it. I tried to make the church grow, but that didn't really work out too well, because the truth be told, it is beyond human capacity to create the conditions in which people turn their hearts and their eyes back to a place where people are going to meet God. Creating the conditions is what's beyond us. As a result, for the last decade or so, I've been a real pessimist about whether we're ever going to find new members to join our churches, whether the, whether the church is going to be a place where people can be fed with the truth of the gospel. I've been a real pessimist until recently, because I sense a gathering storm. You know, it's been going on for a while now, but it just keeps unfolding and getting worse and worse. I mean, you know, you watch the division in our culture, the anxiety, the anger, the everything just kind of flips. It's as though we've come to the end of the way we've looked at things because we can't seem to pro pro solve our problems. In fact, the meta-crisis has come into focus, what people are calling it. You could talk about an ecological crisis, you could talk about an economic crisis, you can 
talk about a social crisis, but at a certain point, all those things are interwoven. I would add a faith crisis to the mix. And as all that's been happening, been gathering, now this business of AI comes up. I listened to an hour-long uh, conversation between Jack Kornfeld and Sam Altman yesterday. Now, Jack Kornfeld is uh, one of the great Buddhist teachers in our nation. He's co-founder of the Spirit Rock Meditation Center down in Marin, where I'm from. A deeply, profoundly believing man. And for whatever reason, a couple of years ago, Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, contacted them, and they've been working together. Sam's been learning to meditate, been trying to get some spiritual grounding underneath him. As he's been leading this company that is bringing AI out into the open. Now, I have to tell you that with all the disruption that AI is going to create, if, if Everybody was like Sam and the people he works with. I might not be real worried, but then there's China and Russia, so I'm kind of worried. You know, because there's a storm coming, because, you know, you listen to Sam Altman talking about AI, and he's talking about, you know, something that's way more disruptive than social media. When he's trying to find an analogy for how it's going to change things, he starts to talk, I don't know, about the steam engine or the printing press. Kornfeld jumped in and said, how about fire? It seems to be an enormously disruptive technology, and, and here's the thing. They figure it will be implemented between five and ten years. The speed of that change will take the moorings out of society. It's terrifying. It, it can be wonderful, too. They're expecting that AI will gather information from everywhere and be able to find cures to diseases that we've, we've not been able to figure out. They'll be able to solve some of the little problems in the metacrisis, not the whole one. I mean, there can be some wonderful things about it, but the disruption that's going to come will be incredible. And I sense this growing shift, kind of like the shift that we've been reading about all these months as we walk through First and Second Samuel. I allude to it occasionally. What was happening at that point in history was that people were moving from a tribal situation where, where the, everybody was blood-related, where everything was centered around this small group, tribal communities. It had been that way for tens of thousands of years. And then something happened, and those tribes needed to band together into nations. It was an enormous change. It turned the entire world upside down. And violence came, as we've read over and over again, as the people that are first making this shift, trying to come into some comprehension of what a nation might be for, are trying to wrestle with what God is and how God works in the world. Trying to wrestle with that. That's why we read this. Not because we think that the violence is okay or we want to live back in that day. We read it because we see people of faith struggling to see and understand God and how God works in the world and what God expects from us when there's enormous change coming. So I sense this growing, this growing thing that society is going to need to turn back to its spiritual foundations. I think God, in effect, although I don't really want to put it exactly this way, I think God, in effect, is bringing the circumstances of the world together to a point where society will turn its eyes again towards the divine. Oh, we better be ready. We better be ready. And the church at large doesn't have a particularly good track record with that. I know you've heard me talk about September 16th, 2001. That was the Sunday after 
they flocked to our doors. Four weeks later, attendance was lower than it was before 9-11. We blew it. We've got to be ready. And I believe that part of being ready, well, let me do the positive first. Part of being ready is to have a community like this in place that's ready to welcome people and let people feel like they're cared about and loved. A community of people where several of you have said over the last couple of weeks during prayers that you can see the presence of God in one another's eyes. That that's the kind of love that we definitely need to do that, but we're also going to have to come up with ways of describing God to the people who say, you really believe in a God who's up there? when we can't even define what up there is anymore. I don't even know what the metaphor, if we call it a metaphor, would refer to up there. We need words that make sense. Now here's the trick. The old words work for a lot of us. The old way of talking about it works for a lot of us. And so I don't want you to feel like anything that I say about a new way of structuring our language about God is saying that the old way is wrong. I mean, I really can't say that because for goodness sakes, God can't be comprehended by words. I can't claim to be right. You know, I'd have to insist that I'm probably wrong if I'm using words to describe God. God isn't quite that small. But of course, <laughs> if you disagree with me, you're wrong too. That's comforting. <laughs> But I do think we need to make the effort. I love this psalm. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims His handiwork. Well, if that's the case, and I believe it is, it tells a very different story today than it did 1,500 years ago when it was written. Because we live in a very different universe. And that's going to impact the way we talk about God, the way we understand how we relate to God. Theology matters, the phrase that came up in the Presbyterian church as we were wrestling with the issue of homosexual ordination. God, could we have not wrestled with that for so long? <laughs> but theology does matter. Our words that we use about God matters because it leads us and directs us into relationship with our God. So we need to figure out what our words might be. And so this is actually the first of five sermons that try to wrestle with the issue of how we're going to describe God and how we relate to God in a way that might make sense to people if they turn their eyes towards the church and seek to touch the presence of God and be changed by it. My theology professor, Doug Otati, said there were five questions that you need to wrestle with, theological questions that you need to wrestle with. And if you've wrestled with them and come up with an answer, you've, you've almost come up with your own systematic theology. You've come up with a, a grounding, a way to help you figure out how you want to approach your faith, approach your God. There's the nature-grace question. That's today's. It was also last week's, so I'm, this is a lot of introduction. Nature-grace question. I mean, how... The God in nature, how does that relate to the God who we perceive and know in our prayers and in the movement of creation around us? How do those two things relate? The nature grace question. Next week is the reason revelation question. What are the sources of knowledge that we can use to understand God and God's expectations of us? That one's going to be about Scripture. The authority of Scripture. You know, in Christianity today, they said that one of the things that non-Christians object to is that uh, uh, people think it's odd to say that that is the Word of God. You know, and so what does Christianity today suggest that we say in return? It says it's the Word of God, and therefore we must believe it. I don't buy it. We're going to have to come up with something different. And there's the sin, evil, and good question. How, what's the relationship between sin, evil, and good? How, how do they infiltrate uh, our creation? And there's the law and gospel question. That's sort of the 
the justice and grace question, right? right? How does law impact us and impact the world around us? And how does that relate to the fact that God's free love and grace keeps coming at us? And finally, there's the church world question. That's how does the church identify itself? Those that, that believe that God is present in these scriptures, how, how does it relate to the rest of the world? And I would say also to the rest of the religions of the world, because we're living in a world where that is a much bigger question than it used to be. So those are the questions we'll wrestle with. And what I'm going to try to do is have it be about considering them, but also about why they would matter. What difference does it make that we're able to articulate those? You know, because it used to be you didn't have to. When I was growing up, everybody kind of believed the same thing, so you didn't really have to share the gospel with anybody. We're not in that spot now, not even a little bit. So those were our five questions. But today it was the nature grace question, which is a question of how, does, how do we see God in nature and, and what happens with it? And, you know, of course, we used to think of that three-tier three universe. You know, flat earth, dome above, God's up there, we're here, and then there's that nether world. Nobody seems to know what that's about. It changes as the scriptures go on, how they describe that nether world. But it's that three-tier universe. Right? And the trouble with that, aside from the fact that we know that's not how the universe is structured, is that it's a static universe. God created. God outside created it. Set it up, there it is. And then from time to time, God either decides it needs a little tweak or we ask God to tweak it in some way, and God comes in and tweaks. But there's a couple of problems with that. One of the problems is that it disappoints us way too often. I mean, you know, if, if God has the capacity to just go in and tweak things when we ask God to do it, well then, you know, how come Ann Cobus lived and my wife Debbie Coletti did not? Ann was a friend of ours. It doesn't make any sense, all right? Something wrong with me, something wrong with her. I don't know, how, how come God allows war? I mean, if God can just tweak things, what's going on? And we come up with all kinds of excuses for why God doesn't do it, but none of them are particularly satisfying. But that's what happens in a static world when you're looking for a God to come in and tweak. It's what we call theism. That's a theistic view of God. That God is out there, God acts upon the creation, God works with creation, God works with us, so on and so forth. And, and the trouble is that all our questions about that focus on us. Me, how come, how come God didn't take care of me? How come I'm suffering? You know, or if I have a, a big heart, how, how, come, how come humanity is suffering? You know, but it, it's really about us. It's not about God. And you, you read the scriptures, you get the distinct sense that God wants us to focus on God and, and not on ourselves. It's a, the trouble is that it, it's this very small God that keeps getting smaller every time we figure out how the universe works. No room for God to do the fixing and the fudging anymore. And so it's disappointing. And it's strange. So what are we going to do with that? We live in not a static world, we live in an evolutionary world. We live in a universe that is evolving. Everything is evolving. So what kind of a God would fit that universe? Well, theism is what it is, and then of course atheism is against theism, right? That's what it means, all right? And maybe you've heard of pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that it is God. Creation is God. There's no difference between the two. But there is another option, and it's what we call panentheism. And this may be a little academic, but I actually think it has some value. Panentheism, that God interpenetrates 
everything in creation. That it's not God, but it is so intimately related to God that you, you'd be hard-pressed to pull the two apart. We see it very clearly, clearly in our doctrine of the Incarnation, who Jesus is, fully God and fully human. Somehow God touches our world and touches our lives. Panentheism, it's the God in whom we live and move and have our being. Though in fairness, I'm not 100% sure that the author of Acts was thinking about panentheism at the time. But what this God would mean, interpenetrating everything, is that I can say to my friend Alan when he says to me, I, I meet God on the mountain, and I say, well, yeah, if you pay attention. Have you ever found that, the people who sort of say that, I don't want to go to church, I meet God on the mountain or out in the fields or wherever, you know, you think, well, okay, that's all well and good, but are you really paying attention to God at that moment? My experience is it's generally not true, but you can, you can meet God on the mountain. You can meet God looking through a microscope. You can meet God when you learn about something as simple as a hummingbird. About a week ago, I was looking at this video of, uh, uh, of how hummingbirds work. You know, most, most birds, when they flap their wings, they, they flap down and they get a little lift, okay? And then they fold their wings to bring them up again. And then they flap down again, not hummingbirds their shoulder blades twist. So they actually get lift as they go up and as they go down, both ways. Isn't that incredible? You can see God in that. You just have to look. You look in the microscope. Again, I, 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 I really do in many ways think that Scientific American qualifies as a spiritual exercise. If you're seeking to understand God when you're reading it, It's enormous when we focus on the God of all creation, the fact that every single thing that happens is God unfolding, God's creative power. It begins to blow our mind, and we, we focus less on me and more on the creative project of God. If we can see God in everything, working through everything. So what does that mean for prayer, though? God's just sort of in anything and through everything. What do you, you know, do, is God present? Absolutely. Because God's created you and lives within you, holds you fast, and did so for a reason. Every single person in this room, every single person you talk to outside of this room has a purpose. You get to play a part in creation's story, and part of what you do is enter into relationship with the God that interpenetrates and begin to work with that God to unfold God's creation. And prayer is a part of that process, saying, here's where I think we need to go. There's a great book years ago that came out that said, Praying God's Will. That's what we're looking for, the ability to pray God's will. Sometimes I think that we should just stop using the word God, because every time I say it, I think we're thinking of the theistic God. Sometimes I think maybe river of grace might work, that, that river that just, that just holds us as we float through life. The evolutionary impulse that just, just forever moves us closer and closer to perfect love. But, but those things feel impersonal, so, so whatever it is we call it, we need to recognize that it lives within us and calls us into a beautiful life. That's the hope. Together we focus on God's creative work. So if you run across somebody who says, oh, I don't believe in God, what you can do is ask them about the God they don't believe in. You know, almost invariably, they're going to talk to you about a theistic God. That's the God people don't believe in. But 
You know, you can say, well, I, I like some of that language, but I, you know, God seems to be more a God that lives within us, a God in, in whom we live and move and have our being and, and unfolds within us. And that God gives us hope, gives us purpose, and gives us a unique role. It makes our life valuable because God does want us to be part of the project. And our lives are richer for it, more hopeful for it, no matter the change that's coming. David was pretty clear on that. He had a vision. His vision was a nation that was focused on doing the will of God in a place that hadn't really developed a way to put God first. I think that maybe needs to be our church's vision as well. To find a way to draw people in and help them to recognize that our God holds us fast and includes us in everything that he does. 